fusil fuiste tú, guerrero para siempre tiempo eterno. ¿Qué puedo yo cantarte? Soldad Bravo here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. You can go to our website to see an in depth look at Democracy Now!'s coverage of Hugo Chavez over the years and related stories at democracynow.org. As we continue on this day after the death of the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez. Juan? Well, I'd like to ask Gregory Wolpert. You've written extensively on uh, uh, on the Venezuelan Revolution, and but especially you have focused on what most of the rest of the people in the United States and other parts of the world have not seen, which is the domestic impact of uh, Chavez's revolution on the uh, everyday life of the Venezuelan people. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. It's just, for instance, you've written that the number of cooperatives uh, in Venezuela Venezuela escalated from about a thousand to a hundred thousand during the Chavez uh, uh, years. Could you speak about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Miguel Tinkas Alas mentioned a couple of those uh, changes, uh, such as the decline in poverty, which is very important. I mean, there are certain things that people always focus on, and certainly the poverty one is very important, uh, which declined by half uh, during the Ch uh, during Chavez's presidency. Also, extreme poverty declined by more than two thirds. Um, but uh, in addition to that, uh, these kind of um, standard of living uh, improvements that happened for Venezuela's poor majority, there were also these uh, elements of uh, participatory democracy that had been introduced. Uh, with uh, Chavez's election. Uh, the, one of the most important, I think, uh, is actually the introduction of communal councils in Venezuela. Over 30,000 communal councils were introduced, which are basically direct participatory, uh, direct democratic structures throughout the country where people work on neighborhood improvement projects, and they really feel like they have a stake and, and uh, acquire an ownership of their community. Uh, this is just one example. And of course, the cooperatives and self-managed workplaces are others. I mean, Chavez was really trying to introduce uh, socialism. Uh, and putting it on the map, really, uh, back again on the map for the 21st century. And uh, it wasn't just an economic socialism, but also a political socialism, by which he meant uh, a participatory democracy, uh, which is what he was trying to create. And that's an image quite different from what we receive here of an authoritarian <laughs> leader. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, certainly Chavez had his top-down management style, which uh, certainly uh, clashed and, and uh, bothered many people. But on the other hand, one cannot deny, I think, that uh, uh, participation in Venezuela increased uh, from any measure that you look at, uh, whether it's the Latino barometro polls, which show that Venezuelans believe that their democracy is more democratic um, than, than it had ever been. and in comparison to what other people say of other countries in Latin America, uh, and also that uh, they've, uh, they're they participating much more in elections. I mean, uh, participation and registration have increased dramatically. Uh, vo uh, voting centers uh, at polling stations throughout the country have been distributed to poor neighborhoods where people used to have to wait a whole day in order to vote. Now uh, it's reduced tremendously, and it's much faster. So there's uh, just, uh, in every measure, like I said, there's uh, more participation in, in the democratic process. Uh, tens of thousands celebrate in the streets of the capital, Caracas, after the results of the 2012 election were announced. Chavez held a replica of the sword of independence hero Simón Bolívar during the victory celebration at a rally outside the presidential palace. Chavez reached out to the political opposition and called for unity among Venezuelans. To those who promote hate, to those who promote social poison, to those who are always trying to deny all the good things that happen in Venezuela. I invite them to dialogue, to debate, and to work together for Venezuela, for the Bolivarian people, for the Bolivarian Venezuela. That's why I start by sending these greetings to them and extending these two hands and heart to them in the name of all of us, because we're brothers in the fatherland of Bolivar. That was Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez last year after his election. We're also joined by Michael Shifter, president of the Inter-American Dialogue, a Washington-based policy forum on Western Hemisphere Affairs, adjunct professor of Latin American politics at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Your assessment of President Chavez's uh, legacy and what he represented? Well, I think he did— uh Chavez really put his finger on legitimate grievance of social injustice and social inequality in Venezuela and throughout much of Latin America. 
Uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that, and I think that was his great contribution. Um, the problem is I don't think he really constructed a, an alternative uh, after 14 years. And I think mainly because his style, his approach, was uh, that he made all the decisions. He concentrated power in his own hands. And that's very, very difficult to construct an effective uh, uh, system, a uh, governance model, <coughs> uh, when only one person makes all the decisions. So my sense is that he had a great opportunity because he had tremendous charisma, connected with the Venezuelan people, cared about the Venezuelan people, and the Venezuelans felt that. And he had a lot of resources. Uh, the oil prices went up substantially from the time he came in in 1999 till now. Uh, he really had an opportunity to reshape in a significant way and put the country on a sustainable path of development. I'm not sure that if one looks at Venezuela today that it's on that path. And I think you have enormous problems that are there. There are shortages of basic goods. There are the highest inflation rate uh, in, in Latin America. Crime is off the charts. If you look at the crime rate when he came in versus the crime rate today, there's this tremendous insecurity. Caracas is one of the most crime-ridden city, cities in the world today. So uh, this is not a government that I think has been very competent and very effective. And I think it's a product of the fact that he is somebody who believes that he represents the general will of, of Venezuelan people. He is a legitimate president. There's no question about that. But you also need to, I think, bring in other sectors of the society. And he was a very polarizing uh, figure. So I think he deserves credit. I think his legacy is, is a mixed one. But I think, in the end, this will be seen as a great opportunity for Venezuela uh, that was squandered in the end. Ava Gollinger, your response. <clears throat> well, um... I think that at least Michael Shifter recognized Chavez's legacy in terms of uh, changing the lives of Venezuelans and particularly the poor. But um, I strongly disagree with the assessment of the fact that he didn't build one a sustainable model, two an alternative, viable alternative for the country and for the region. Because um, before, as Greg was saying, Chavez opened the door, opened a pathway, began that that pathway, and and on and took that road to transforming Latin America forever. I mean, Venezuela has been transformed forever, talking about the level of participation. Today in Venezuela, more Venezuelans participate than ever before in history. Everyone has a voice. Everyone wants to be active and involved. Before Chavez came to power, and I lived there during that time, um, it was an, a country full of apathy, full of apathy, full of exclusion, people who didn't even care about participating because their participation meant nothing. That's changed 100 percent and will never reverse its course. Uh, at the same time, much has been focused on, on Chavez, the man Chavez Chavez, because he was an all-encompassing figure. He was larger than life. You know, he had this enormous personality and, and tremendous charisma. But at the same time, the vision that he had and that he began to implement collectively, along with the people of Venezuela, was about power to the people. And I think there's no question that that has taken root in the country today. We're see we've seen it. Even after Chavez was um, elected in October and then was diagnosed again that the cancer had returned, and he was unable to participate in elections that followed after that for governors, for regional elections. Nonetheless, he didn't appear in one campaign event. His party won in 20 out of 23 states in the country. I mean, it was a clear showing of the leadership that was growing within the ranks of, of, of his party. At the same time, we've seen, you know, people are, are pouring into the streets of Venezuela and have been throughout this time period saying, I am Chavez. And that doesn't just mean, you know, I love Chavez. It means Chavez represented me, represented my family, my community, my interests. And I think that today what we're seeing in Venezuela, it, through these communi communal councils, through all this popular participation, is a collective leadership that has grown. And I think that in the end, that was Chavez's overall objective, how to transfer that power into the hands of the people, empower the people so that they feel they have the capacity to govern their nation. And I think that that has unquestionably happened in Venezuela, and that's one of the, the strongest elements of Chavez's legacy. Uh, Greg Wilpert, what about these uh, issues that, that my, uh, Michael Shifter raises of the increasing crime rate in, uh, in Venezuela? I'm not sure that Caracas is yet at the level of my—the uh, place of my birth. 
number is Puerto Rico in terms of crime rates, but it certainly has escalated dramatically, and the inflation situation and the unsustainability of the economic model that uh, that Chavez has developed. Well, I mean, I you know, obviously disagree as well that I think it's definitely sustainable. Um, Venezuela, for example, I mean, people keep mentioning the inflation. True, it's very high, but it's lower than it was in the pre-Chavez years. It averaged 50 percent per year in the two presidents before Chavez, uh, and he brought it. Chavez brought it down to around 20 percent uh, in, in these last couple of years. The average, I think, is around 22 percent per year. So that's a, a decent achievement for an oil-producing country that basically uh, earns its uh, foreign currency in oil and funnels it back into the social programs into the economy, and that, of course, generates inflation. But as long as uh, incomes rise faster than inflation, it's not really that big a deal. I mean, it's a, it's a hassle. It's a problem. Um, but it's not uh, unsustainable. Uh, the other thing is, um, I think that uh, certainly crime is an issue, and it is a serious problem. I think it was basically based on a, a miscalculation on the part of the government. They believed that once you get poverty down, crime would go down by itself. And uh, they didn't do enough to actually uh, make sure that there's enough police that decently functioning judicial system, and, and that's really one of the big uh, areas where a lot more needs to be done. Um, but other than that, really, I think, uh, the, like I said, uh, there's uh, economically and uh, socially there's been tre uh, tremendous achievements in the last couple of years. Yeah. And uh, Miguel Tinker Salas, uh, I'd like to ask you about the uh, the issue of oil and and the importance of oil in Venezuela to the to the uh, uh, to the Chavez revolution. Uh, and but I First, uh, I'd like to play a clip of an interview that we did uh, back in 2005 when President Chavez was here uh, for the United Nations General Assembly, one of the first uh, uh, televised interviews that he did here in the, in the United States, where he spoke to democracy now about the role of oil in his country. So we're now providing. First, we're ensuring the supply of oil, direct supply of oil from state to state, in order to avoid the speculation of multinationals and traders. They buy gasoline in Venezuela, and then they go to a Caribbean country and they charge double. So we are selling the products to the states directly. We are not charging for freight. We assume the cost of freight. But apart from that, this discount is not of 25 percent, it goes to 40 percent of the total. And this money will be paid back in 25 years' time with two years of grace and 1% interest rates. So if you make all of the mathematical calculations, the donation percentage is almost 70% because it's a long-term adjusted 1%. So, what Venezuela is doing is supplying 200,000 barrels of oil to the Caribbean and other Central American and South American countries, such as Paraguay, Uruguay, and smaller nations in South America. 200,000 millions of barrels. If you apply calculations, mathematical calculations, by 1.5% of our GDP, 1.5% of the GDP is devoted to this cooperation. It means that we are financing these sister nations that next year will reach $1.7 billion a year. In 10 years, it's $17 billion. It's a way for us to share, to share our resources with these countries. That was President Hugo Chavez in September of 2005 in an interview, exclusive interview with uh, Democracy Now, uh, that he uh, held with Amy and myself. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you, Miguel Tinker Salas, the, Im the impact of the oil policies of President Chavez on the independence of the Latin American region uh, and uh, the ability to uh, to export uh, the idea of a social revolution uh, throughout Latin America. Yeah, I think oil has to be understood as something that is not simply an economic 
question for Venezuela. It's also a very important political, symbolic, and cultural element within Venezuelan society. For Venezuelans, it was supposed to be the vehicle to modernization. And when Chavez comes to power in 1998, oil prices were less than $7 a barrel. Uh, so in many ways, what, what the government had to do was to reconstruct a vision of Venezuela that included oil as part of the motor of change, of social change in Venezuela, uh, not only for Venezuela, but also for the region. And oil was its most important cachet. So for the first stage we saw was an effort to reclaim the oil industry, which began to operate essentially as an international conglomerate that was housed in Venezuela, but did not really consider itself Venezuelan. So that was the first stage we saw in the context of reclaiming oil and of attempting to create oil within us, a sustainable uh, bandwidth in which Venezuela could sell oil commercially and then also in HA social programs, and then also be able to provide it as it did in the San Jose Accords in the 1970s along with Mexico to Central American countries, to Caribbean countries that had to pay very onerous prices. So what Chavez's government does is to use oil not simply to buttress relations with the U.S., but to buttress relations with Latin America in a very important way to provide oil and long-term credits to countries like Nicaragua, like uh, Dominican Republic, uh, like uh, Jamaica and other countries in the region, uh, and including Cuba, and using that to create a, a tremendous amount of political goodwill because it recognized that Venezuela has an important role, not simply as a purveyor of energy to the first world, to the U.S., which was its dominant trading partner, but really to Latin America. And then that notion of economic nationalism, of economic sovereignty, spread throughout Latin America. We saw this, the same example in Bolivia, nationalizing the gas industry. We saw Ecuador rejoining OPEC. We saw the creation of Petro Caribe, a Caribbean initiative that provided oil at uh, short-term, long-term credit rates to the Caribbean. We saw the provision of oil to of heating oil to communities in the U.S. Uh, under the banner of CITCO, so that northeastern communities uh, that had to pay onerous prices received oils at subsidized prices as well. And we saw also Petrosur, the creation of a South American oil uh, body that actually helped negotiate uh, conditions for oil industry. So in many ways, many of that's attributable to the policies that the Chavez government instituted. And I think that's what was sustainable. I think the previous system that had existed before 1998 was unsustainable. And the reality is that with that kind of recasting of oil and of its symbolic importance as a part of the integral development of social development of Venezuela, we saw that clash between the imaginary Venezuela that saw itself simply as an international uh, oil producing country and now reclaiming the oil industry uh, as part uh, and parcel of the social development within Venezuela. A, a major chasm had developed, and I think that's what was healed under the Chavez administration. Um, Miguel Tinker Salas and uh, Gregory Wilford of Venezuela Analysis, Eva Gollinger, Venezuelan American attorney, close friend of President Chavez, uh, Greg Grand, and um, of New York University, New York Public Library, and uh, Michael Shifter of the Inter American Dialogue. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Also, ask the question how is it that uh, President Chavez managed to survive a coup against him, that other leaders from Aristide to Salvador Allende to um, uh, to President Zelaya of Honduras did not manage to um, survive. Stay with us. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.